If you'd like to um, open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 20, I'm going to start at verse 9. Now what I'm actually going to do is uh, augment this passage, because what Luke did, I don't know whether he was running out of scroll or whatever, but he tended to chop chop bits out, and this is one bit that he he chopped out. So I'm going to go to uh, Matthew as well and just put a, a bit back in that he'd taken out. So this is Luke... Chapter 20, verse 9, augmented. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. He rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I'll send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they'll respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked them, what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone that falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he'd spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Okay, now, when I grew up, I had three older sisters and the wiser heads here will be thinking, ah, I know, three older sisters will be thinking three things. One, they really wanted a boy. <laughs> they kept going. Two, I was really sport rotten as a child, and probably my sisters would agree. And three, oh, such a disappointment. <laughs> okay. But that was the home that I grew up in. And when I grew up, music was very, very different. My earliest memories are sitting around the, the Sunday lunch t- uh, table, listening to, I don't know many people remember this, worldwide family favourites. And you'd get uh, Colonel so-and-so, uh, who was uh, on tour in, uh, in Malta, say, sending his love and his best wishes to his family. And that was what we grew up with. Things got better. We had Radio Luxembourg coming in and out all the time. The signal was fading on, on medium wave. And then, of course, we then had the pirates. Um, so why do I tell you all this? Well, I, I tell you this because sometimes um, my sisters particularly will be listening to a song that was Billy Fury, Adam Faith. And then mum would shout through sometimes in the kitchen, that's an old song. And they said, no, no, it's a new one. No, it's an old one. It was sung years ago. And that was the situation. We, we now call them covers. We know what they mean. Um, so why don't we tell you about this? I tell you this simply because that's exactly what Jesus is doing. This is an old song, this parable that he's bringing to us here. It's not new. Um, it's actually very old. Let me read you the original version of Jesus' cover song of this parable. And so this is Isaiah chapter 5, if you want to follow it. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hillside. He dug it up, he cleared it of stones, and planted it with choicest vines. He built a watchtower around it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwell as in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with my vineyard. I will take it away its hedge. It will be destroyed. I will break down its wall. It will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, 
and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And so he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. And so you can see Jesus draws heavily on this. Now, if we could have that uh, slide up, which I lovingly prepared for you. Okay. Ah, there it is. Okay, so there you've got the two side by side. Uh, You've got Luke on the right, and you've got Isaiah, um, oh, sorry, on on the left and Isaiah on the right. And you can see the parallels, okay? Uh, You can see, put a wall around it, and there is back to Isaiah talking about the wall he put around. Dug a wine press in it, and so again, you can see uh, in the Gospels of the wine press there as well. The watchtower, again, the watchtower is there. And there's a question which posed, Isaiah poses a question, and so does Luke. Now, if this was Jesus' exam submission for writing a new parable, uh, the markers would have said, he's plagiarised this. And so Jesus goes back to the Old Testament. But we shouldn't be surprised at that, because so much of Jesus' teaching came and is rooted in the Old Testament. And it is said, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament concealed. Something like that. I'm sure you can get your heads around that when I've, I've messed up for you. So what was Jesus' aim in using this parable? What, why was he, he, he doing this? I'm just picking out two reasons. There are several. But the first thing was that he knew when he said this that the Pharisees, the priests, the scribes would know exactly what he was getting at. He, he knew that they would connect it together. The second reason why I think he did this was to hold out hope. Because to be honest, when you look at uh, Isaiah's version there, God literally trashes his vineyard. And here, when Jesus takes this parable and reimagines it, what Jesus is doing is holding out hope for the future. And there's quite a contrast. So why did the Jewish leaders oppose Jesus so much? Well, I think to understand that, we need to understand the Jewish mentality at the time of Jesus. Because the temple was central to, to the whole spiritual lives. The temple was the centralised place of worship that Solomon brought in, and that stopped them uh, sacrificing so much on, uh, on the hillsides to other gods as well. Um, it was the place where God was perceived to dwell in a special way. You know, we go into Canterbury Cathedral and other cathedrals, and it's quite inspiring But we know that's not where God really dwells. But to the Jewish mind, there was something quite different, quite special about the temple. And that was where God was was dwelling in a special way. Everywhere, obviously, but there as well. It was where they were told to give their direction of prayer. So Solomon, when he dedicated the temple, he said, if you get in trouble um, in his prayer, then if if you fall into sin, wherever you are, look towards Jerusalem, look towards the temple and pray. And if you repent, God will hear you, and God will deliver you. Uh, It was the centre of a uh, pilgrimage. So there's three major uh, pilgrimages that they had, Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot. Uh, That's where they went three times a year. Jesus went for Pesach on Passover. So that was when Jesus' parents took him up to the temple. So it was the centre of pilgrimage as well. It was also, of course, and mainly the centre for forgiveness that's where the sacrificial system was. If you'd had a bad week and you realised that you'd really screwed up for God, you couldn't just think, oh, this has been terrible. I know, I'll take a lamb, I'll go out in the back garden, I'll slay it, I'll make a sacrifice uh, for forgiveness. You couldn't do that because a sacrifice had to be done in the temple and it had to be done by a priest. So you had all those things together and can you begin to see that if you control those elements, if you control those items, if you're saying to people, you know, no, this lamb you bought is just not good enough, here's one that's pre-prepared for you. If you can say to people, well, yeah, your money's great, but you'll need to change it for temple money, can you see how they controlled the people's spiritual lives? And so that's why Jesus comes into this situation. That's why he turned the money tables over, and that's why he spoke against the scribes and the Pharisees and the priesthood in particular. So 
you can see that Jesus went right into their turf and upset them and uh, challenged them. The Romans were bad enough, but at least they allowed the, the Jewish people to continue their religion. Uh, here, ordinary Jewish people were beginning to listen to Jesus and to follow him, and that's what concerned them. And this parable that he told tipped them over the edge. That was for them the last straw. I think really if we look at how Jesus reimagined this parable then, um, one thing that comes out very clearly to me is just simply this, God expects fruit. He expected it then and he expected it now. So this, let's look at, at the way God expects fruit. So God was obviously the owner, both parables. He rented out to others, both parables, well not in both parables, in this parable he rented out to others which was of course the, uh, the Jewish leadership, and then he went away for a long time. That's quite a theme in the Gospels, is, is this uh, idea of God going away and being absent. And so he seeks uh, servants to send to uh, collect the, the, his share of the harvest. That's not unnatural. The prophets are rejected. And if you were a child in those days, you wouldn't have grown up thinking, oh, I want to be a prophet when I grow up. Okay, there was quite a... Uh, yeah, it's a prophet was something you didn't want to be in Old Testament times particularly. And so he thought, surely they will respect my son. And so he sends his son. Now it's important to realise that the son was just not another messenger. The son was someone really special. Not just another messenger. He was God's last word in Revelation. Jesus is the pinnacle of God's revelation. Jesus is the absolute zenith. It gets no better. It's got no better than Jesus himself. And think of the, the way the writer to the Hebrews opens up his epistle. Now, you'll know the context. The Hebrews was a, a letter written to Jewish people. It was a Jewish believing church. And they were struggling. They were coming under persecution. And for once, for example, they were being persecuted for being Christians, not for being Jews. So it was quite a different sort of context. And for them, it was quite easy to think, well, we could, we could just go back to the synagogues. We could go back to temple worship. It's still the same kind of God. And so the righteous of the Hebrews says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Jesus is better than. He's better than the angels. He's better than the priesthood. And you get this better than, better than, greater than, all the way through the letter to the Hebrews. And so he starts off his letter, and this is how he starts it off. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, many times and in various ways. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, Hosea, go and marry a prophet. Oh. Um, Ezekiel, lie on your side. How, how, three, how many days? And so various graphical ways, as well as the verbal ways, God spoke to his people. But in these last days, the writer of the Hebrews says, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And through whom, I love, I love the way he does this, almost like a tossing it in at the side. And through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance, the radiance of God's glory. A near enough represent no 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 an exact representation of his being of God's being sustaining all things so creator radiance exact representation a sustainer of all things a sustainer of you and me that's the the way that the writer of the Hebrews opens up this letter we could go on we haven't got time but we could have gone to Colossians. I think it's chapter 1 in Colossians where you see Paul doing exactly the same thing there. And uh, I think also of John 14 where Jesus has said, well, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Don't worry, don't let your hearts be troubled. And Philip says, oh, I'm not worried about all of that, Lord. Just, just show us the Father and that will be a, enough for us. And I do let my imagination run, but I can just imagine Jesus taking hold of Thomas' wrists and saying, Thomas, look into my eyes. Don't you know, sorry, Philip, don't you know me, Philip? Even after, even after I've been with you such a long time, anyone that has seen me has seen the Father. So there's no one else to follow 
after Jesus. There's no further revelation needed from Jesus. So we have to say to our Muslim friends, I'm sorry, there was no need for the Quran. Jesus is the last word. We have to say to Mormons, I'm sorry, there was no need for Jesus, J Joseph Smith. Jesus is the final word. Mary Baker Reddy, et al. There is no need for anything. God has no more to say than Jesus, the final revelation. And that's why we're here this morning. So if Jesus is that important, you might think, why, why did God the Father risk that? Doesn't he realize that he's been taken for a ride? Um, and that does beg us the question, why is God so patient with the world that we live in? Some people say, well, he's indifferent. Uh, other people say, well, actually, he's just impotent. He can't do anything. The truth is that God is slow to anger. It comes across several times in the Bible, but this is Numbers 14. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So, can you imagine if that was flipped the other way around and it said this, the Lord is slow to love and forgive sins and rebellion and abounding in anger? Can you imagine if that was the kind of God we were here to worship this morning? We are here to worship a God who is slow to anger. Yet God is patient because of love. His patience does and will run out though. And so we have to be mindful of that. We have to ask the question, why is God so patient? And I think basically it's because God knows how awful that day of judgment will be for people. And because of that, he keeps putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And that's what we read in Peter. God's not willing for anyone to perish. He's giving people as much time as he can. But we know that Jesus has said there will be weeping and wailing. There will be gnashing of teeth. That day is coming, but he's putting it off. He's putting it off. He's slow to anger. And so, back to the parable. Uh, they killed him, predicting the uh, actions, I guess, of the leaders quite clearly. Uh, what will the owner of the vineyard do, was the question that Jesus raises there. What will the owner do? Well, obviously, the people in the crowd were thinking, well, he's going to just kill them, isn't he? That's the obvious thing to do. They've been wicked. He's going to destroy them. Absolutely. So when Jesus said he will kill the tenants, they were thinking, yeah, that's the right thing to do. But then Jesus shocks them to the core because he turns around and then he says, and give the vineyard to others. And you have to under, again understand the Jewish mind because they're, sit, they're standing there thinking, no, no, we can't go through that again. Because in their heart, in their memory, was the time when they were taken from Jerusalem, from Israel, into captivity, into Babylon, 70 years. And as they were leaving, the, the, the temple was being sacked. The temple was being destroyed. And when they heard what Jesus was saying, they were like, we can't go through that again. We can't do that. But there are lots of ways of looking at that. And Isaiah's uh, parable, and his use of parable, that's what he was pointing towards it. But Jesus takes this parable and he turns it into a different way. So it's not so much the destruction of the nation, although they were moved out, it was the destruction of the leaders and ultimately the temple. And less than 40 years after Jesus uttered this parable, 70 AD, Titus came, destroyed the temple, and Josephus tells us that he killed 1.1 million Jews. And so the fulfillment, though, was not the destruction of Israel as such. The fulfillment was the taking of the vineyard, of the leadership, and giving it to the Jewish apostles. It's almost as though God is raising up a big sign above it now saying, vineyard under new management. And so for the first 10 years of the church, it was exclusively Jewish. So people were sharing the message Jewish person to Jewish person, Jewish people were becoming believers. The Gentiles weren't getting a look in at all. And it, if you read the Acts of the Apostles, it's quite interesting the way that God gets the message out to Gentiles. But the first big controversy in the church, do you realize, was you. 
and me. We were the first problem that the church had to face. Because when Peter went uh, to Cornelius, uh, it gave him quite a problem. What, Gentiles? But, okay, yeah, we, we don't mind Gentiles becoming believers, but obviously they've got to be circumcised if they're men. They've got to become Jews first, then they can believe in the Jewish Messiah. So that was the first big controversy in the church. And thankfully, I speak as a male, um, that argument didn't hold sway. We don't have to become Jews. And because what Paul is saying is that really the, the, in, in Galatians 3 particularly is that there is a joining together of Jew and Gentile in one body, one uh, bride. When Paul is talking in Romans 11 of the olive tree, he says the Gentiles are being grafted in to Jewish stock. He doesn't say, well, God has just done away with that olive tree and there's a brand new one. No, no, no. We have been grafted in. And whichever way you look at it, you see this morning we're worshipping a Jewish God, we're worshipping a Jewish Messiah, we've been reading from a Jewish Bible, admittedly Luke was the only Gentile, um, and we, we, our faith is a Jewish faith, a Jewish faith this morning. So where are the Jews today? Well, I guess it's kind of back to Elijah, isn't it? You remember when God said to Elijah, he'd fled, and God said to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, well, they, 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 they've killed all the prophets, and they're chasing me, and I'm the only one that's left. And God says to Elijah, no, no, there's 7,000 people. Okay, you don't know them, but there are 7,000 people that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And still it's the same today. Um, in Israel, in the 70s, there were a handful of Jewish-believing congregations, Jewish people that believed Jesus was the Messiah and worshipped together. Today, it's estimated there are about 300 Jewish-believing congregations in the land of Israel, as well as everywhere else. So things are beginning to happen. And Paul is emphatic in Romans 11. Has God rejected his people? No way. He used a very strong uh, term in the Greek. Have they fallen beyond recovery? No. A partial hardening has happened uh, until the full number of the Gentiles comes in. Now, there's lots of ways of looking at that. Uh, some people say, well, when the last Gentile is converted, then God will turn again to Israel and he will revive them. Personally, I don't have a set form on that. All I know is that God hasn't finished with them all I know is in Zechariah, it says that Jesus is going to come back, his feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and the context of that is the world coming up against Israel. I don't understand it, but I believe it because it's there. Has he finished? No, he has, certainly has not. King Frederick of uh, a great, uh, the Great of Prussia was once asked by his physician, or he asked his physician, give him proof uh, for the existence of God. And the physician turned to him and said, Your Majesty, the continued existence of the Jews, where are the Hittites, where are the Perizzites, where are the Hivites, where are the Jebusites, gone. Where are the Jews? They're still around. And so, let's get back to the parable. Uh, under the leadership of the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, there was no fruit being produced for God. Now it's under new leadership. The church, the vineyard would grow, would swell out, and would spread and be fruitful across the whole earth. And, of course, the people still said, no, so why, why did Jesus point to this uh, uh, verse in Psalm 118, which is where it came from? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So why did he quote that verse? Well, he quoted it because they didn't have to go away and look it up in a concordance. What does that mean? And put it back into context. The Jewish people, all the Jewish people, knew that verse very well. It was part of the Hillel. And the Hillel it was Psalms 113 to 118, which they would sing and which they would chant as they went up to Jerusalem, the three major pilgrim festivals. And the Jewish people still use those Psalms today. So for the Jewish people... This, the stone the builders rejected, was a bit like, Ark the herald angels sing. It was like a Christmas carol. Everybody knew it. So they understood exactly where he was coming from. It wasn't obscure. And what Jesus is saying is, he's underlining the fact that he will be rejected. It's the stone that the uh, builders rejected. But still, he is the cornerstone. And three days later, um, Jesus was then on his way with his disciples 
up to Mount Olivet. And there he was going to be arrested, beaten, tried, ultimately crucified. But on his way with his disciples, three days later, he turned to them and he said, I am the true vine. And three days earlier, this would still have been fresh in their minds because they would have been a bit concerned when Jesus told this parable as well because they were thinking, I'm just so glad there's so many people around because they are really annoyed. And so it would have been in their mind. So Jesus then turns their mind back to the vine. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. So they would have fully understood Jesus linking that back. So despite all this provision in the case of the children of Israel, they were a nation that disappoints God. And Jesus is saying, "Ah, but I'm the vine. Abide in me. And that's the key phrase, abide in me. And that's a bit of homework for you today. Go and read John chapter 14. Um, it does say, remain in me, but you can't beat the word abide, can you? Abide in me, because that's really what Jesus is telling us to do. So how do we abide in Christ? How do we do ab abide in the vine? Well, if we actually go back to Isaiah chapter 5, you look at God's provision, and it really is quite remarkable. Uh, in that uh, parable that Isaiah tells, he says, well, my beloved chose the best soil, and he selected the perfect point, which is on a hillside, so the sun gets it south-facing. It was an absolutely perfect spot. And you are where you are, you are when you are, and you are who you are. In other words, God has placed you here and now to work for him. There's no accident why you're here. There's no accident when you're here. God has work for you to do. And so what we have to do is to be prepared for that work. And just look at what God does. Okay, the first thing Isaiah tells us is that he removes stones. Now, that's not an easy job because there's a lot of stones in Israel. It's very stony soil. And we're all here from different backgrounds, all with different needs. Some people had addictions. Some people suffer from pride, from anger, maybe from la uh, laziness, brokenness. Maybe we've got unhelpful relationships in our lives. God comes along and removes those stones. He's a hands-on God. He's not distant, he's not far off, he's not unknowable, he's hands-on. He's built walls and hedges to protect us, so all those rodents are kept out. And that means that nothing happens to us that God doesn't allow to happen to us. doesn't mean that everything is going to be good. The Christian life certainly isn't rosy. Um, it might be that annoying colleague that you have to work with day by day. It might be your husband, okay? But there is someone there just knocking those chips off uh, uh, to get you into the image of Christ. He is shaping you. He builds a watchtower. Um, and that watchtower is not just uh, for protection so we can see what's coming off. It's so that we can be aware of what's coming up. If I go to that situation, into that situation, is that going to be helpful? The watchtower is so we can look in advance. Um, the watchtower is also a place to go if you are overwhelmed. You can hunker in with God. It's the hiding place. And the watchtower also tells us that it's God overlooking us, watching out for us. He built a wine press um, because obviously the fruit that God gives us is to flow out for others. Uh, and he waters us with refreshing rain. But you have to drink. You have to come every morning to the place. He cultivates and prunes. He takes weeds away, which will compete with their lives. One of the things that surprised me was when, when we had a few orchards was the fact that um, we had to herbicide. And I was saying, well, why do we have to, to put weed killer down the bottom? Said, well, the, 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 it's only grass. He said, yes, but it competes for nutrients for the, the trees. And that's why we have to do this. This is why we, we spray it all. And also, I was talking to the pruners once, and I said, that, you've, you've pruned that really heavily. He says, ah, yes, he says. But when you prune heavily, the trees then think, ah, what's going on? And it's then that they put all the effort in to actually produce more fruit, 
uh, for their survival. And when God is pruning us, that is sometimes why he's doing it. He's doing it for our good to make us more um, profitable and more fruitful. Pruning is never impersonal. You can't do this sort of pruning uh, with a machine. It's hands-on, and God himself is pruning us. He's cutting out dead wood in their lives. It's not vindictive. He's putting it on a bonfire. It's not vindictive. It's necessary because dead wood can harbor disease and all sorts of issues. It has to be destroyed. Habits, relationships, all these things can sometimes hold us back. So, I'm here to tell you this morning that as branches, producing fruit is not really up to us. The branch doesn't actually do the fruit. All the branch does is stay in and abide. And if it does that, fruit is produced. So how do we abide? God's done all these things for us. How do we grow? How do we mature? How do we please God? How do we achieve sanctification? How do we get to know God? How do we get to know God's will? I have to be brutally honest. You've got to want it badly enough. It's as simple as that. It's not a kind of an optional. Uh, You've got to really want it badly enough. You've got to want to spend time. Because if you don't, you won't. And if you don't spend that time, you won't get it. And so prayer, studying the scriptures. I'm sorry, it's always the same answer. There isn't a a magical uh, button that you can press. It's the same answer. And you might say, well, I find prayer difficult. How much did you engage in prayer week? We had a really good time. How much are you engaging in life groups at the moment? And the studies there that we're doing. Our life group is really buzzing with it. I'm sure other life groups are. It's really good. Um, And I just find it so reassuring because um, I remember one of the the, the videos, he said, well, you know, sometimes I pray, sometimes I read the Bible. And I, that's what what I do. And if you say to me, well, I I find reading the Bible hard. Well, it is hard. But get yourself a good study Bible. That's actually transformed my quiet times. Um, Let me show you mine. I don't normally bring it because it's heavy. But it's absolutely fit. It's got pictures in it as well, which is really good. But you've got all these central references down the middle. Um, and down here, you've got commentary. Um, now, sometimes I think, mm, I don't agree with you there. But a study Bible can really help your quiet times. So please, if you haven't got one, get one. It took me ages uh, to decide on this one. You find the one that's right for you. Um, if you just Google um, or just go onto YouTube... What best study Bibles you'll come up with? Lots of options. Study Bibles really help. It's good to do that. So I must bring this to a conclusion now. And I want to go back uh, to the heart of the Father. And you remember he said, I will send my son whom I love. And if you don't believe that God the Father loved the Son, all the way through the Gospel, uh, God makes three cameo appearances. Um, and that's the way you can look at it. The director wants to get in on it. So when Jesus is baptised, um, the, the father can't help himself with all the pride that he has. He says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He's lived 30 years perfectly, sinlessly. He's done all that and gosh, am I proud of him. And then the transfiguration uh, Peter's standing and he's saying, uh, one, we'll, we'll, build a, we'll build a tabernacle for you, Jesus, and one for Moses. And, and, and it's almost as God says, Peter, shut up. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And then Jesus asks, Father, glorify your name. And God says, oh, son, oh, son, I've already glorified it in you, and I will glorify it again. You can see that love that he has there. And you look at uh, Abraham when God told Abraham to take his son, and the language is very good, isn't it? Your only son, he says to Abraham, whom you love, and sacrifice him. And so there was the parallel. So God is asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, and he knows himself he is going to sacrifice his son. And he knows that when Abraham lifts that dagger up to bring it down onto Isaac, he's going to say, stop, 
He's going to send an angel. But when the father is saying this to Abraham, deep in his mind, there is this whole issue here. In the forefront of God's heart, he knows that when that soldier is getting that whipped with bone and metal in, ready to bring that down on Jesus back for the first time, there's no one going to be there saying, stop. He knows that when they press that crown of thorns onto his scalp, there's no one there going to be saying, stop. And he knows that when that soldier lifts the hammer up to bring it down, to drive that nail through his hands, there's no one going to be there saying, stop. And he also knows that when that soldier takes that spear to thrust it in Jesus' side, there's no one going to be there saying, stop, stop, can't you see he's dead? And so that's why we come to the communion table today. Because the worst part of what God went through was knowing that he himself had to pour all his wrath, all his anger onto Jesus on the cross. He had to turn his back on Jesus and do all that. That's why he comes to us this morning and says, and where's your fruit?